on this call or from many of you are on the advisory board to this project <laughs> and others might be aware of uh, the big creator of this project. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of just background to the project and the, uh, the background to BCA Web Tools. Um, we're happy to provide some further discussion later on in the webinar about some of the redaction work that we've been doing if people are interested, um, but that's not really the intended primary focus of this webinar. Um, we just know a lot of people have been following what we've been doing with BCA, um, the Bitch Creator Access Project, and are kind of interested in the current status of the BCA Web Tools and what its functionality is. So. Um, just a little bit of background, um, and hopefully if anybody posts any questions through WebEx, um, maybe during the talk, then somebody can shout at me because I won't see them. I'm just looking at a full screen of slides right now. Um, so the BitCreator Access Project, if you're not aware of the chronology of this, we have the, uh, the three years of BitCreator, which was a uh, two-year project followed by Phase 2, um, all of these things funded by the Mellon Foundation, uh, and we've been on this cycle where our project this has started on October 1st and then run, you know, through the end of September. Um, so you might have noticed that we're in September currently of 2016, which means we're doing with, dealing with all the fun of, you know, figuring out the final budget numbers and reporting and all that from this project. Um, and it's been based here at Sills and UNC, funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, we've been developing open source software to support access to disk images. So, you know, most of the people on the call, I presume, are pretty familiar with the function of the BitCurator environment itself and the idea that you create disk images, you extract, you know, file system information with FireWalk, you run bulk extractor to get features out, but then there's this natural next question of now what, how do I actually provide access to it, which of these things should be access points, right? So we've been looking at um, uh, tools and reusable libraries, that meaning, you know, reusable software code to support web access services for disk images, and that's going to be the primary discussion of today, I have no idea why I decided to redact uh, to uh, to make redacting complex foreign digital objects bold because that's not, not actually going to be <laughs> the primary focus of today. Uh, I'll talk just a little bit about that, um, and also analyzing the contents of file systems and associated metadata. Uh, so some of you have seen this before when I've given discussions about these. One of the motivations is that you know if all you needed to do is provide disk images to people, then you just put them on an, out on a server and they download them, right? But uh, we often want to provide some kind of mediation where they're only going to get to parts of it. There might be things that are struck out or redacted. Um, and so if you don't know about emulation as a service, it's this, you know, nice initiative um, at um, University of Freiburg that's been going on for several years that has this kind of proof of concept that's also been used in a lot of interesting cases to let people load up something in emulation on the fly, basically. And so these first two options are both based on emulation as a service. Uh, the first one has to be based on emulation as a service because it's reflecting a core functionality built into that environment where you can use this copy on write overlay to only load certain parts into the emulated environment. So the idea is if you had a disk image and you didn't want an end user to see all of it, you would essentially give instructions to emulation as a service to only load certain parts into the emulator. Um, the other uh, option is that you redact things out of the image, right? And as I said at the very beginning, this is something that's um, ongoing work with the uh, BitCurator Access project. You can go into GitHub and get the code and the, the tools that we've developed already. But, um, it would be even better uh, if you tuned in a couple weeks from now uh, when we'll be doing a more formal release of the, the redaction tools coming out of the project. Um, and then um, browsing um, non-live file system um, using BCA Web Tools, which is primarily what we're going to talk about here. Uh, so in terms of emulation as a service, just to give a background to this, there are too many, two primary use cases here essentially, right? One is you're just running something in emulation to run it in emulation, right? Like the picture there in the bottom right. Another is that you can use emulation to essentially facilitate migration, right? You can load up an application in an older emulated platform and use it to convert to some other format. Um, and again, you know, this is not intended to be a talk about emulation, and I know many of you are aware of this, but just to point out that the bridge to that work has been part of what's been going on in this project. Uh, the team there, for example, has added support for, um, this happened a couple years ago, adding support for um, forensically packaged disk images so that you could load them into an emulator. Um, redaction is something that, again, um, we do have um, a few people um, who uh, were asking uh, fairly soon to look at and try out these redaction tools, um, but it's kind of a soft launch in the sense that um, some of the functionality is still yet to be developed in the next few weeks. 
Uh, but if you are interested in what's there, the BitTorrent Access Redaction Tools, you can go to GitHub here and see it. Um, and again, in the Q&A, if people have questions about that, we can certainly answer more questions about it. Uh, but finally, I just wanted to point out the BCA Web Tools as this scenario, and this is what's then going to kick over to, um, to Cam, who's going to demonstrate it, and we can answer any questions that you have about, you know, how to implement it or how you might run it in your setting. Uh, so BCA Web Tools essentially integrates a lot of the same software that if you're a BitCurator user, you're already very familiar with, all these things running underneath in terms of generating DFX XML, generating premise, you know, the stuff that just happens. Uh, but having it run on the server side so that people can access this functionality through a browser, essentially. Uh, so this is the underlying architecture. All the tools at the top of this picture should look very familiar to you if you've really dug into the BitCurator environment because it uses the Sleuth Kit and FiWalk and all these other tools to export the metadata. The things down below and to the right, basically all the rest of this picture, is the things that make it possible to navigate the content in a browser and also to search over it because it's got these database stores underneath. Uh, so this is basically what the interface looks like. You can see this is just running on a local machine based on the URL there. Um, and if you put disk images into it, uh, the simplest scenario is basically you drop a disk image into this environment and you don't have to do any further processing, right? You don't have to index it. You don't have to describe it. You just point to it. And then if somebody follows that link to there within uh, the BCA Web Tools environment, they can then either just download the whole disk image, see the basic information about it. That basic information you see will be familiar to you if you've ever done the thing in the BitCurator environment where you right click and say show disk image information. It's just that basic information about the disk image. Um, and then, and um, again, downloading could be enabled or not. And the browsing is that ability to dynamically walk down through the content of the file system. So dynamically is an important thing to point out there because it's not asking you to export all the files and folders in advance. It's just going to a disk image as its file that it's accessing and then using those software libraries underneath to open them up as somebody's clicking through. Um, so that means that you don't have to do a bunch of this initial processing. Um, you'll see on the right side there that it says search by file name or search by content. If you do want to enable that sort of functionality, then it requires some additional steps. You can see in this administrative interface, uh, you can build the DFXML table so people can search over the DFXML output, things like file names. And if you do the full uh, index of the content of the files themselves, you can do full text search. And there are important qualifiers there because it won't just obviously search over any arbitrary type of file that the software doesn't understand. You can see the documentation on the GitHub that explains which file formats it can support, but it's, you know, sort of the main office formats in PDF and text and HTML and things like that. Um, so, again, you could make the determination to run this, and then, of course, it's going to, you know, if you have a lot of big disk images, it'll take a while to crank away. Um, or you could just, you know, if you needed ready access to some disks, it's sitting in a reading room, it's sitting on your desk where you're doing some archival processing, you don't want to do a full text search, you just kind of want to navigate the disk images, you could drop them into a directory and immediately start accessing them in a browser here. Um, this is what an end user is going to see when they then click on one of the disk images. They'll see the contents in terms of files and folders. Um, and I should point out that this actual interface that you're seeing, we're not expecting to usually be, you know, we're not thinking you're going to have BCA Web Tools as this big, huge icon on your website, right? <laughs> that um, this is um, has a RESTful interface. Um, and the presumption is that clearly you could just use this as is, and it's up and running. But we're presuming that a lot of libraries and archives are going to use the underlying services to present this in their websites however they expect things to look in their website. One thing about the architecture of this is that it doesn't have the kind of flat structure you might have like in Drupal or somewhere where everything just has a little node number. It has a hierarchical structure so that if you look up above and you see that URL, it's showing you the image and then the directory path down into the image. So that can be really useful if people need to navigate back up into the disk image. And it also means that once this gets out there and a crawler follows these paths, that you, the crawler could then essentially lead somebody back up to the source disk because they go to that location and then they could navigate back up. Sorry for that abrupt uh, drop to the blank screen. Um, that's all I really wanted to give as background. We presumed that most of what you were interested in is actually seeing the software work and having plenty of opportunities to ask Cam and me questions about how it works. So I'm going to unshare my screen and hand it over to Cam. Are there any questions at this point?
Okay, so great. Um, it looks like I am up. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet. I don't see it. You did share a screen. All right, now everybody should be able to see my screen. So, uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm Cam. Um, I've, uh, sorry, I noticed several of you, or uh, maybe the majority of you, have uh, seen, <clears throat> or seen or heard us give talks about this before. So, uh, I'll use part of this time just to give you a, a bit of an update on the, uh, on the development, the document. Uh, some changes in how the tool runs uh, over the and, and what we've been working on over the past uh, few months. So if you've uh, if you haven't already been to our uh, the wiki associated with this project, that wiki is at access.thecreator.net. Um, uh, on that site, you can find uh, links to the GitHub sources for this tool, uh, links to the current and past releases, our quick start guide, which uh, is so if you're if you're going through this after the fact after this webinar, you can find this um, you can find this there, and it'll basically step you through the process of configuring uh, configuring your machine, downloading the software, uh, uh, determining what the minimum requirements are for uh, to run this, and so on, uh, and including all of the uh, all the other requirements. Uh, there's a few other bits of software you need to run this, so. Um, you should be able to run the software in basically any environment that you can run Vagrant and VirtualBox in. So that's Windows machines, Macs, uh, Linux machines, and so on. And uh, and yeah, so uh, just so you know, this is there, and we continue to update this to uh, reflect the changes in the new versions. Um, so uh, over the past few months, we've been working on several modifications to the tool to try and make it a little bit more robust uh, to try and uh, build out its capabilities for managing and working with additional types of disk images and additional types of file system formats. And uh, the first major change that, that sort of came about, I think, a, a couple of months ago was that in addition to the forensically packaged disk images, the E01 packaged disk images, the tool can now uh, parse raw disk images. So it uses the underlying uh, sleuth kit functionality to uh, to uh, parse through the, uh, the, you know, the first few blocks of the, the disk and try and make some, uh, an estimation of what file system is actually on that disk. Sometimes, uh, you know, in some, in many cases, it, this is not too difficult to do. In some cases it fails. So uh, when you read this text on this main wiki, just keep in mind that uh, this doesn't mean that it's a <clears throat> magical, all raw format finding uh, tool, but for most of the formats that we've listed here, FAT16, FAT32, NTFS, HFS Plus, uh, EXT file systems, uh, the, it, it usually manages to identify uh, the, the file system and in fact the file systems on multiple partitions on those disks. Uh, you'll notice uh, again the HFS uh, the old HFS file system and a few others are still missing. Uh, obviously, this is a limitation of, of TSK. In addition to uh, to that change, we've also recently shifted the underlying uh, uh, web service support for the tool uh, away from the development server that was being used before, and so that it now runs under Nginx with micro WSGI as the process management uh, system. So. Uh, this tool is now pretty close to being able to be deployed uh, in a production setting uh, from uh, just from the sort of uh, not falling over <laughs> side of things. Um, so, uh, so how do you how do you uh, how do you build it? So right now you can go to our uh, you can go to our GitHub. You can either clone out a current release 
uh, sorry, you can either clone out the master or you can go to our uh, releases. The most recent release was just a few, uh, ten, about 10 days ago. We're going to push up another one today. Um, you can download these as a tar.gz file or a zip file. Unzip them. Um, uh, in order to in order to run the the service, you need VirtualBox and Vagrant. So Vagrant's a, uh, a deployment system that basically automatically builds a VM, a virtual machine for you in VirtualBox, starts it up, uh, and then <clears throat> sorry maps the uh, maps the appropriate port for the web service so that you uh, so that you can uh, you can access the web server on your local machine or on the internet. And I'll show you two different examples of that in a few minutes. Um, uh, the the build instructions as well are also on this uh, on this site in addition to in the quick start. So if you if you're comfortable building those tools uh, from scratch, uh, you should be able to do that here as well. Um, we do include in this source some sample disk images. So there's a disk image directory in the source code on our GitHub that includes a couple of, uh, right now actually just four E01 disk images. We're going to add some raw test disk images soon. Um, we've limited the number here because obviously when you pull down the source, you're pulling down all the disk images as well, and we don't want you to have to download hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of disk images every time you, you pull down the source. So if you uh, if you want to add disk images or test the tool with additional ones, place them in this directory, uh, and it will it will recognize any raw or forensically packaged images in that directory. Any questions about that? I can no longer see the chat window, so I can't see if you know. Here we yeah, go. There are many. Okay. Um, so here's what it looks like uh, on my on my Mac. Earlier, I brought up I brought up the tool. I uh, I cloned it out. I typed Vagrant up. You can sort of see this in my in my uh, terminal here. Um, so I just ran this this one command up here. I'm going to highlight it here so you can see it after I installed Vagrant, and all of the rest of this, all of the, the rest of the build process just happens automatically. Uh, it provisions a virtual machine, uh, it, configures the, uh, it configures SSH access into that machine, pulls down all the necessary packages, and so you can see there are quite a lot of dependencies just to, uh, to get this running because, uh, well, partly because there are a lot of dependencies for the forensic tools and partly because there are a lot of dependencies for the, uh, the, uh, the web service. When it pulls all those down for you, uh, builds them, starts up the machine, and once it's started up, uh, at least uh, if I'm running it on a local machine here, I can go to uh, a, a tab, and I can type, well, I'll pull this tab down and show it to you from scratch again. I can go to a tab, go to localhost, uh, where the uh, where the web uh, traffic's being re redirected, click there, you'll see uh, here, in fact, is the interface that Cal was showing you earlier. When you first bring this interface up, you have uh, access to which, whichever disk images were originally placed in that disk images directory. Uh, right now, that uh, that location is fixed. In a in a future release, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to configure that in a in a config file and point it at, say, a network location. So on. Uh, we haven't quite finished that uh, that function yet. Um, and basically, when you bring this up, no matter how many disk images you had in there, you have instant access to them because uh, the tool is just making calls to the underlying SwiftKit library to parse these on the fly as you interact with them. So if you click on info, you'll get uh, some basic file system metadata, or sorry, some basic metadata about the uh, about the file, uh, sorry, about the disk image package. So in this case, you can see it's an uh, MK6 uh, format EWF file. Uh, shows you the acquisition date, the media size, the MD5 of that file. I'll go back. I browse inside that disk image. Uh, the first, the first level uh, of uh, browsing that you'll see here is the partition level, and this is because some disks may have more than one partition. Uh, this page will never show you. Uh, it'll never show you boot partitions or uh, swap. Areas it'll only show partitions that appear to have reader uh, readable user mountable file systems. So in this case, uh, this was a USB drive that had a uh, that had a, a XFAT file system on it. 
And when I click on, sorry, and again, when I click on browse, that'll take me into the top level of the directory, the root level of that disk. Uh, this is a little bit different from just browsing the file system uh, on your uh, on your desktop as if you had mounted the drives. These drives are, or these disk images are not mounted. Uh, again, this is just TSK pulling out the file system metadata and displaying it to you uh, directory by directory. So here, in addition to the files that would normally be uh, seen in your, uh, uh, in, if you were to mount this disk, you will see, uh, you will see some hidden in system files. If there are deleted files, you will see those as well, the way it's configured by default. So it will automatically try and identify any materials that have been deleted when it can identify them. You will also see over here, this DNR just means directory or regular file. So you can see regular files here. If I click on one, it'll download it. Downloaded this one earlier. Um, but sure enough, it'll open it. So that actually, uh, again, made a TSK call to pull that file directly out of the, uh, directly out of the disk image without mounting that disk image. Uh, likewise, I can click on directories, uh, navigate down into directories and see files within those, uh, within those directories as well. And of course, go uh, navigate back and forth as you would expect. And uh, as Cal mentioned earlier, if you see up here, um, you do have, in fact, the full hierarchy of the uh, of the disk image, including the disk image name, the partition you're in, the directory you're in, uh, and the current inode for reference. And that's uh, that's so if you're using the RESTful interface, you will be able to uh, reference uh, the uh, sorry the uh, the parent inode as well if you would prefer to use that. Um, over here on the right, we have uh, options for searching. When you first bring the uh, when you first bring the interface up, uh, this these options are they're they're there, but they won't work because none of the pre-processing has been done. So in the uh, in the in the current interface, you need to uh, build the DFXML table in the database. There's a Postgres database that runs underlying uh, that underlies this uh, this interface or the the search system. Uh, and the reason that we don't pre-populate that is so that you have instant, instant access to the interface. Um, so when you bring it up, you can start these uh, database, uh, sorry, you can start these database population uh, routines in the background. And the way you do that is to go to the admin interface. Cal showed you this earlier. If you go to uh, show image matrix and click submit, you will see uh, the current status of the dat database for each of the uh, disk images. You can see there's an image table that uh, has been pre-built uh, pre because it just includes basically very simple metadata about the, the disk images and their availability. The DFXML table has not currently been built. This is what will uh, allow you to search by file name. Uh, it'll extract and index all of the file names associated with the files, are associated with the files in each of the disk images. So if we go up here and click build DFX, DFXML table and click submit, uh, we'll get a little uh, we'll get a little uh, information uh, logo down here that says it's being built. Click here to see the status. If you click here, um, you'll see it's in progress right now. You can continue to reload this page. Uh, building the DFXML table for small images doesn't take very long, so uh, this is already said uh, told us you know here it succeeded. And again, this interface isn't you know this is this is just for back back end administration. This will be. Uh, turned off in the in the final production version for uh, for users. So if I go back to the admin interface and I go to show image matrix again, sure enough, we will see that the DFXML table has been built, but none of these files have been indexed yet. Uh, now, if I knew one of these uh, images was particularly large and I wanted to, uh, or uh, or for some reason I didn't want to index it, I could I could index these uh, separately. Or if I wanted to prioritize indexing, I could. Uh, I could uh, I could I could add in the indexes for uh, tables one at a time. Uh, for now, I'm just going to uh, generate the index for the whole uh, for the whole set. And again, I'll get this information icon that'll say the search index is being generated. This may take some time, uh, and the reason this is taking some time is that uh, uh, on the back end, it's using Lucene and the Python interface to Lucene. So if you've ever used Lucene. Uh, Lucene does full text, uh, you know, indexing on these on these contents. Um, the 
BCA Web Tools system is essentially cracking open the disk images, pulling out all the files that are likely to have a lot of text, uh, PDFs, docs, text files, uh, any, any text-rich uh, format, feeding them to PyLucene one at a time and having it index the, uh, extract and index the text. Um, so this can take a long time. If I go to click on task, task status, it'll show uh, that it's in progress. Um, for these disk images, I think this takes, I, I can't remember, it takes, uh, it usually takes five or ten minutes, maybe a little less. Uh, but it does, uh, no, actually this one, this maybe I removed one of the larger disk images, so this one actually only took about a minute. Um, so uh, if I go back to the home directory, I can now in fact search by both file name and the content. So if I look for content that contains the term email, click on search, I will see search results for email. It'll show me uh, the directory, the full directory path in a particular disk images. Um, links are not turned on for these in these versions. They will be in, a, in an upcoming version, uh, but it'll, it'll show you each of the each of the results that's relevant to your particular search. Uh, likewise, I can search by file name. So if I um, go back home and look at my disk images again, sorry, uh, search by file name. I can't remember. I think there was something called astronaut. I use the same examples for a lot of these tests. So. There we go. So those, there were there were two or three files in there uh, on the, those disk images uh, with astronaut in the file name, um, and we separated those out because you know uh, eventually we may have additional more sort of sophisticated uh, uh, search capabilities in here, but we thought these would probably be um, consistently the the ones that uh, would be desirable for. For users, uh, we haven't. Well, you know, we're still soliciting feedback on this. So, if you're interested in sort of searching by date range or searching by uh, size, this this could also be turned on fairly uh, easily. And that's just about it. You can also download the disk images from the uh, from the tool. So, if I click on download, it'll just Download the file. So if you uh, if you want the if you want the complete disk image, you can see I downloaded this one earlier as well. Um, but that's all served out uh, by uh, uh, by the web service. Uh, somebody uh, when we were talking about uh, the development of the RESTful interface for this, somebody noted that uh, they were concerned about using uh, using REST calls to pull large uh, file items or binary items from the service. And uh, because they had discovered that that didn't work particularly well in an existing collection where they were, say, uh, using them to, uh, to uh, I, I can't remember what it was, something like download tips from a, from a large uh, collection of large images. And that's not how uh, this uh, System has been designed, so the the, uh, the restful calls that are available or will be available in this upcoming version are uh, are just calls for the file system uh, metadata, essentially uh, calls to get a listing of all the disk images, a listing of uh, the uh, a listing of the files within the uh, partitions and files within those disk images, and then listings of metadata associated with those files. Once you have that metadata, you can simply download the file directly, and it'll be served out by the uh, by, by Nginx. So. Um, so this is uh, you notice this is a version of this running on my laptop. So I have it up at one you know one two seven dot zero zero dot one is just my. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, local machine here. If I go and look in the original Vagrant file, oops. So the Vagrant file is the main file that tells your, uh, that tells Vagrant how to, how to configure and provision the, uh, uh, the machine. Uh, here you can see there's this, uh, this, uh, sorry, the, the original web uh, port has been forwarded right to the to the local host. This this comment is actually wrong. But it's forwarded uh, port 80 on the guest where the web service is actually running to port 8080 on my local host, which is why I am uh, at this web address. Obviously, you can configure that to whatever port you wanted. Um, you can also deploy this to a 
uh, to a uh, dedicated machine, which we have, uh, which we have, or sorry, at a dedicated URL. So this is a public instance of this. You can go and try this out right now. Um, it's at bca.ils.unc.edu colon 8080. Um, I can't guarantee how long that machine will stay up because it's behind um, or it's in a DNC and it sometimes gets attacked. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, yeah, we've put that up so you, you can try it out, but it's, uh, you know, it's it's not too hard to get it up and running on on uh, most machines, uh, you know, laptops, desktops. Uh, we've configured or we've configured and designed it so that it uh, it doesn't require that much memory. The virtual machine by default. Uh, uses four, uh, it's configured to use four gig of memory and two CPUs. It'll run just as happily with uh, a gig of memory and a single CPU. Uh, indexing obviously takes a long time when you're running in a VM with one CPU. So, so uh, I think that's the full run through of the tool right now. Does anybody have any questions now that I've done that? Sorry, I was just asking Cam to mute because we're in the same room. One thing that I just wanted to point out, if you go to GitHub where Cam was showing, um, where it was um, the BCA Web Tools, um, just to point out that, you know, obviously if you're building out all kinds of sophisticated things on the server side in your institution and integrating this with other things, it's not just a matter of pointing and clicking and bringing it up. But in terms of bringing it up using Vagrant the way Cam was talking about it, I can say as somebody who's clearly not a sophisticated system administrator, Really, it is just a matter of getting Vagrant um, and then doing this Vagrant box, add Ubuntu the instructions that are there, and typing Vagrant up. And that's literally it. Then it comes up and runs on your machine, right? And it'll take a little while because it's building. Essentially, what Vagrant is doing is building a whole virtual machine dynamically. It's seeing what all the dependencies are and constructing the machine to serve as a server on your machine. But, you know, this can be useful for testing in the sense that if you just want to get started with it to see how you might use it, you really can bring it up on a machine that you've dedicated for this quite quickly. And it also could really make sense if you're using it, for example, in a reading room where you've got, you know, somebody wants to look at, you know, 25 or 30 disk images and you're trying to figure out a useful way to just let them navigate them. Essentially following this process with relatively little overhead, you could just essentially bring up a little local server that then would let them navigate through the contents of the disk image, right? If you didn't want them to have to use, you know, FTK or the full BitTrader environment, but you wanted to give them some way to be able to navigate around the contents of the disks. So at this point, yeah, we could open it up to any questions you all have. I've unmuted those people that looks like they're, they're on the phone, but um, if you're logged in, then just uh, be sure to press unmute so we can hear you. Or feel free to chat any questions into the chat box. Is there any questions for Hal and Cam? Um, hi, y'all. Um, I've got one question uh, for the uh, directory where the user or the archivist uh, puts the disk images. Um, are you all anticipating uh, folks putting that, making that directory um, like a network or a, a share folder or something like that so that um, the curator access would be kind of pointing to uh, remote uh, disk images that might be on a server or something like that? Um, and uh, you know, how much performance or functionality do you, do you all anticipate in, in that direction? Um, so I can say a little bit, oh, am I, am I hearable? Yes, um, I, can, uh, I can say a little bit about that. So the, that, obviously that is, um, that's not the, that's not the greatest feature of the, of the tool right now, right? Um, the, the reason that we haven't, uh, well, so I should say the background, the reason we haven't fixed that already is that it was, you know, there were other other more broken things that were higher priorities. Um, the next uh, update to this will basically be 
uh, a configuration, um, sorry, uh, a configuration line in uh, the provisioning script that you'll be able to update that will just say, is there a path on the machine where you're going to run this that uh, uh, that's accessible? And if, if you can enter that path, it'll uh, it'll work. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of accessing remote shares, I, I guess the answer is. Uh, for probably for the upcoming versions, uh, providing uh, providing a local mount or a local link to that share is up to you. And once you have that, um, the tool will be able to talk to it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, regarding the the performance hit, I mean, the performance hit is basically what it is, right? Depending on your network and your and your uh, and your your NAS or your or your, you know, enterprise storage or whatever, you know, whatever it looks like. Um, you know, it'll be, it, you'd take the same percentage hit that you would on on any other kind of file access. Oh, hey, no problem. Um, this is, Diane and Aaron from Cornell. We were wondering um, if you've done any testing with the, the integration between this and emulation as a service. So uh, not recently, and partly that's, again, because our development uh, time has been focused mostly on uh, sort of fixing our backlog of, of uh, existing issues with this tool. Um, we are still in contact with the BWF LA team. Um, you know, one of the, the last major change that they made to that tool was uh, was writing the block driver so that that tool could talk to, uh, so that that tool could talk to uh, E01 or EWF images. Um, have you uh, have you tried out the version of that tool that does that or that's capable of, of firing those up? No, actually, we, we just tested out the version that just did raw disk images, so we haven't tested it out with any uh, forensically packaged images yet. Okay, so as far, you know, so so the last the last round of testing that I did with it was, uh, you know, basically just to make sure that that functionality worked. Um, the, the integration that we envisioned was that in, you know, that this interface was supposed to be very, very lightweight, and uh, you know, eventually we would have a link out that if you had a uh, if you had a version of BWFLA running somewhere, you would be able to point it at the appropriate uh, the appropriate address for that disk image. But the, yeah, that we haven't we haven't done any significant work on that integration yet. Thanks. Yeah, and so you you sorry, Ken, muted now. <laughs> um, you you may have seen a paper that we did with them in IPRES last year where we kind of talked about the connection between the two. But, you know, r really ultimately it's a matter of implementation within a given institution, right? Because you could essentially have DCA web tools and right along with, you know, having a link to download the image or browse it would be, you know, well, open this in, in, in an emulator, right? And it's, you know, I think progress on that depends greatly on institutions who want to kind of make that happen and then working with, you know, the big curator access team and the and the emulation as a service team to kind of you know do that as a proof of concept. I mean, I think that would be great. <laughs> we certainly know in principle it's possible, and like Ken was talking about, with the ability to to load the forensically packaged disk images into that emulated platform, that's kind of the key bridge, right? Because that's the kind of disk image that a lot of archives have now, and a lot of the ones that people are presumably going to be navigating through in the BCA web tools. I guess I should also say just in terms of sort of process and procedure is that because we're in the final month of this project, uh, the BitCurator Consortium, who is, you know, administering this webinar and offering a variety of services to members, um, is essentially the home and steward of these kinds of products as they carry forward. So the degree to which some of this follow-on work happens with BCA Web Tools and Emulation as a Service and any number of these other things, I mean, that very much includes includes the redaction work too, because we'll have software that's available. You know, like I said, it's out there now, but in the next few weeks, there's gonna be uh, further improvements to that software. Um, it's 
really going to be dependent on the community to kind of prioritize which things should be further developed and enhanced, right? Because, um, you know, we'll likely have future research projects that we can report soon, but that's not going to be in and of itself the work around kind of maintenance and, and you know, installation and testing of all this. That's really going to be happening, I think, within, I mean, that's the excitement to me about the activeness of the BCC itself is this is kind of the forum where a lot of that's going to be happening, you know people testing them out, comparing notes, seeing what works for them in different settings. Other questions for Cal and Cam? Oh, Gabby just chatted one. Do you guys see that? I'd be curious to know whether people are, are imaging using BCA to facilitate internal staff access as well as researcher access. Well, that's well, certainly a, a use case that, that we had envisioned, right? Uh, perhaps even the, uh, the more... Yes, I imagine you're not imaging, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so we, we've had we've had additional discussions uh, with people regarding this. I think Cal has a, a something else to say, but uh, certainly uh, the the impression that should have been given here was not that this was a purely public access tool or uh, purely a, a, a tool for researchers. We also see this as a tool that's uh, you know that can facilitate uh, rapidly kind of uh, uh, you know pr uh, parsing the contents of a collection when you're uh, preparing it for. Uh, hey, Yeah, and this is just to reiterate what Cam was saying. I mean, we have worked with some institutions that um, have essentially um, conveyed to us that they're, um, I don't know where it stands, but that they're looking to using it for exactly that purpose, for basically building into their workflow where it's like, well, this is, you know, an easy way for me to navigate around the disk images by just running it locally, um, uh, including one institutional repository where they had planned to charge their developers with building essentially what BCA Web Tools is, right? Because they knew that they had to have some way for their internal staff to look through the concept of, of disk images once they got to that point in their workflow. And essentially, once they knew that this, you know, was out there, they figured, well, why would we build that ourselves? Um, and as Cam was talking about, I mean, there are these kind of three tiers, right? There's the public access that we really hope this does facilitate, obviously, cases where people can put things out there for the public. If, there's no reason to think there are any sensitivities. You know, it's publications. It's just, you know, clearly there are a lot of archival materials that we can put out there directly for access, uh, but also in a reading room, right, where you might have a situation where you want to be able to, you know, kind of supervise the, the use, but you want them to be able to navigate through this kind of browser platform um, or, again, used by archivists themselves. And I think in that second tier, one of the things I try to emphasize when talking about it is that I think many people, when they start getting involved with just applying forensics to archives, if we want to use that huge umbrella term, at first see it as just a huge amount of additional work and daunting kind of undertaking, that really in many ways it can make all the work much, much simpler, right? In that if you image a disk, you don't even have to think about what's on the disk. <laughs> if, if somebody wants to access the content from it, you throw it into a this directory that Cam talked about, and they can start navigating the content, right? So really, the degree to which you stake the steps beyond that of doing original, you know, additional arrangement description, identifying sensitive content, whatever it might be, is kind of layers on top procedurally, you know? The path toward just saying, I've got data on a disk, I just want people to be able to get to it, is incredibly simple from, from the actual human effort point of view. You image it, you drop it into a directory, right? And as long as you have this running somewhere, they can start navigating it. And if you index it with that process that Cam showed, then they can start searching over it, right? And so I think that's a really important part of all of this to recognize is that it can add lots of bells and whistles, but it can also just greatly facilitate situations where you're in a very minimal processing mode and you're trying to figure out how to just, you know, get stuff into the hands of people to be able to look at, whether it's, you know, people working in the archive or end users when you don't have the ability to do incredibly detailed description. Right, you're just considering it to be a bunch of bits sitting on a disk. And just to just to follow on that, um, one thing that Cal and Cam and I had discussed um, was, you know, in, a, in addition to we we normally send out sort of a post post webinar survey just to get some feedback from you all, but 
for this one, uh, we might include some more specific questions around if you've already tested and what sort of use cases have you been thinking about BCA Web Tools to start to to gather some of that that data from BCC members. I think that would that would help with you know considering um, you know you know either more recent pressing uh, issues or um, things to consider for sort of future future development activities as well. So that that's something that would you know that sort of post work webinar survey would go out to you all that attended, but I think also something we could consider sending out to the entire membership as well, just as sort of an add on to say like, hey, we have this webinar, you can come look at this recording. We're also curious to hear more from BCC members specifically about how they're either already testing or thinking about how they might uh, implement BC web tools. So um, we'll yeah, and I think on. And I would just okay. add to that. I mean, I think that's a really good point, Sam, and I would add to that. I mean, two things about all of this that we've learned. I mean, of course, we all know if you think about, um, you know, the way a profession evolves is no one little team like ours can test everything because it, it requires a whole profession to do this. <laughs> um, but the other is that we really learned early on, I mean, five or six years ago, when we were undergoing this work when we thought we're going to build this big test corpus and then we're just going to run all our tools against it is that, you know, archive are very cautious for understandable reasons about like essentially just dumping all their primary sources on our development team and so we really really do depend on all of you as members of the professional community to test this stuff out and tell us about either success stories or problem cases or whatever because we're not going to have all the data that's in your collections right the only way we'll know how it works on your collections is if you tell it how it works in your collections and we're happy to test it if you want to send us all your materials, but <laughs> we've found that in most cases, archives are pretty reluctant to do that. So even after all these years, we have a test corpus that we run tools against, but it's more limited than you might think because we've often run into roadblocks of people just saying, no, we really have to do that testing ourselves. We're not going to send you all of our archival materials, right? So, so let us know what works and what doesn't, right? I mean, that's how we'll actually be able to progress in terms of not just bugs, but you know, figuring out what the functionality really is that people are going to want to be building into their institutions. Yeah, those are yeah, those are great points. I think we could continue to to build on that. And the BCC really has a role in helping, you know, facilitate that. Uh, collecting of feedback and uh, use cases and requirements and all that, that sort of activity. So um, keep an eye out for that uh, survey, um, but we still have a few more minutes. So if anybody has any other questions they want to throw out there before we, we close things up, please do. Okay, with that 10 seconds of silence, <laughs> um, thank you all for, for attending and participating. I hope this, this provided a little more insight um, to what's going on with the web tools. And uh, keep an eye out for the survey and uh, keep an eye out for future webinar announcements. Hope everyone has a, a nice weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.